Hi, good morning, everyone. Hi, hi, Duncan. Good morning, Michelle. Can you hear me from the yeah, end? Morning. Morning, morning. Sorry, I forgot I had my headphones. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, how's it going? <laughs> good, good. Yes, yes. It's ten. It's ten o'clock, and uh, we have about a hundred and thirty participants. Yes. Can we give them five minutes if that's okay with you? We can start at ten o five. That's fine. Great. Yeah. Let's meet back here at 10 05. Okay.
Right, good. Uh, Duncan, I think we, I believe we can start right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to module eight. Today we'll be tackling uh, investor readiness. Duncan needs no introduction. He's been with us. Uh, he took us through module three, sales management. Duncan, this is your time. Take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, maybe let me uh, set up quickly then we pick it up from there. Great. As Duncan is setting up, ladies and gentlemen, we will take questions on the Q&A section parts, and we will do our best to answer all of them at the end of the session. Um, also, by the way, we have a surprise module coming to you, which will be scheduled for um, 10th November. Uh, which will tackle digital payments for SMEs. Uh, so do join us then. It will be same time, same link. And uh, we'll send reminders before then. Duncan? Okay. Uh, I think now we can start. Yes, we can. Yeah, so good morning, all of us. Uh, my name is Dave Wandungu. And I believe I've, uh, we, are, we have met before with most of uh, you. I'm happy we have quite a number of participants, uh, over 200 uh, listening in today's presentation. And today's presentation is on investment readiness uh, for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Uh, before uh, you have had other presentations, you have had entrepreneurship, you have had marketing and business communication. Uh, I took you through business planning and strategic planning. And today we are winding up uh, with the investment readiness uh, for MSMEs. So it's a very interesting uh, presentation and uh, build up to what we have been learning all this time. Uh, it is a bit advanced uh, uh, presentation because it makes assumptions that we have had a very good foundation, uh, which I don't doubt in other packages. So I'm happy to be here with you again for the next uh, two and a half hours, uh, talking about investment, talking about capital uh, accumulation, uh, talking about uh, business growth as one of the um, very important areas of uh, business management uh, that leads to growth in investments and growth in uh, profits and also service delivery to uh, a, num a big number of um, consumers. Because at the end of the day, uh, businesses are about uh, consumers and uh, the value you can deliver to consumers. So in this uh, presentation, we shall have uh, quite a number of items. We shall have uh, an overview to investment readiness we shall look at aspects of investor readiness or investment uh, readiness. Uh, we shall have a very uh, crucial uh, study on uh, capital raising process, which is very important for small businesses and big businesses, whether in micro, small, or, or medium. We shall also have the dimensions of investment readiness, benefits, and barriers of uh, investment readiness. And uh, to start off, we, uh, we are going to have uh, a foundation on uh, mindset because my, my mindset is important in business uh, starting, business development, uh, the mindset of the business owner is very important. And mindset is the established set of attitudes and outlooks or philosophies to, to life or values that a person has towards the business. Um, in entrepreneurship, you looked at 
the reasons why we start businesses. And um, I believe my colleague took you through uh, the reasons behind why we start businesses. Interestingly, uh, many entrepreneurs start businesses to be wealthy, to be rich. Where richness means having a lot of money to spend uh, as they wish, uh, to buy items, buy cars, buy plots, to buy, you know, modern uh, conveniences and look different from their friends. Um, that could be one of the reasons why uh, some people start their businesses. Some start businesses to provide a service to the community. And uh, others start because their friends have started. You know, there's those who do businesses because they have seen their friends uh, starting businesses. And so there is some peer pressure on uh, your friends telling you, we have started a business, when are you starting yours? So the reason to which one starts a business is very important because the reasons are as many as we have uh, people in the world. You'll be surprised the reasons you get when you ask uh, entrepreneurs why they started their business. Others start businesses because they have retired from other engagements. And so they are looking for a place to while time away because some have money. They are not looking for money. They want a place to pass time. Others have retired poor and uh, they want to make money now with their retirement money. So they want to start to use the retirement money to set up a business and make money. So there are so many reasons and they are very interesting reasons which have uh, had the benefit to hear from entrepreneurs uh, where they start businesses. So the mindset with which you start a business is and how you proceed with it is very important. And uh, many businesses that are started to be of benefit to many people, uh, usually they do well because they are not geared to a personal benefit. They are geared to service to humanity. But that's a general observation. So the mindset, and we are going to take a little bit of time here because it's a very good uh, foundation stone to business growth and development. So generally, a mindset is divided into two. And uh, I'm saying generally because when you go to study mindsets, they are quite a number. But I want us to look at the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. When an entrepreneur has a fixed mindset, usually he or she operates the business in fear without motivation, without expecting uh, challenges, feeling limited, you know, with a predestined um, uh, growth pattern, you know, sticking to what they know. They don't want to learn. And these kinds of businesses are there where entrepreneurs operate them, started them 
with a fixed mindset. And I'll give you an example. When we grew up in the, in the countryside, you used to see uh, small shops uh, in your shopping center. And those shops, they never, uh, you used to find it, it's always halfway stocked, halfway full. The operator is there for all the years you have known. That shop has always been there. But it has never been well stocked. It never dies. It has the mindset of the owner. Because the owner is not growing. So the business cannot grow. There is no way a, a business can grow and overtake the thinking of the owner. Yeah. So the business grows as the mindset of the owner uh, grows. So if you have done your business for some time and it is not growing, the problem is not the business. Most likely, you might be having limitations in the way you view the business. You might be having a fixed uh, mindset because it cannot grow until you grow. So that is one of the mindsets that really aff in affects the growth and development of our businesses. So if it's not growing, you are not growing. If you're not growing, then most likely your outlook to that business, your attitude or your, your mindset to that business, most likely is fixed. And so when it is fixed, you don't experience growth. On the other side, we have uh, the growth mindset. A growth mindset is an outlook that is ready to learn all the time. Business persons with a growth mindset, they don't view uh, failure as failure. They see a failure as an opportunity. They view failure as a lesson. A lesson that helps you to do better next time. They are open to opportunities. With a, with a growth mindset, you are open to new ways of doing things. And I can give you an example. When Corona came on 13, 13th March, 2020, personally, I had never trained to do online. And for the first time, you could not do any physical training. Uh, throughout 2020, 2021, where up to today now, the physical ones are coming back. So I used Zoom for the first time in March 2020 because all the training, uh, physical one on one training, had been stopped by the government. So those of us who are in the training, like myself, who uh, didn't want to venture in online training, they stopped working. Those of us who saw this as, as an opportunity went to learn how to use uh, online mechanisms. That's why we are using Zoom today. And that is how I'm able to reach 343 participants from somewhere in Nairobi and participants all over the country, some even outside, uh, outside Kenya. So, we see this as an opportunity because we have a growth mindset. When you have a growth mindset, you value feedback. And by feedback, I mean negative and the positive uh, feedback. Even at the end of this training, 
I will get positive and negative feedback. But both feedback is very good and very important for my growth and for my uh, improvement so that I can be able to improve how I do it next time. So with a growth mindset, you are inspired by the success of others. You don't feel like when others succeed, they are uh, curtailing your progress. When you have a growth mindset, you want to try new things. You want to try uh, uh, new things in your business. You want to try new products. You want to try new methodologies. And most probably, you are in it for the benefit of others. As I indicated, most businesses that start with the benefit of others in mind, most likely they do better because you won't provide a service to a big mass of people. But those with a narrow um, perspective of becoming rich and buying a car and buying, you know, looking, you know, rich, usually uh, that one is not usually sustainable. So I'm talking about mindset because from here now we shall talk about growing businesses and accumulation of capital. Because without a positive, without a growth mindset, you are going to run into so many problems with the capital, as we shall see uh, briefly. So enterprise development is for growth mindset without which you cannot progress. Because business grows to the extent that the business owner also grows. It cannot overtake the owner. So with that understanding then, we can go now to the overview of investment readiness. When is a business investor or investment ready? It is when it is able to meet the expectations of investors from who <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the business person wants to request for capital. Because this is external funding. Because the business person maybe wants to develop new products, you know, to expand capacity, to go to new markets. And you can't do this. You cannot develop new products. You cannot expand production capacity. You cannot access new markets without justification uh, through the market research. And if you don't uh, use market uh, research to develop new products, to expand production capacity, to access new markets, most likely, if you get new capital, it's going to be a very big problem to your business. And this is a a mistake that is committed by many, especially micro uh, businesses. They are too quick to access loans from uh, providers, especially the online uh, loan providers who have come of late, the Fulizas, the Talas, and so on. People are quick to take capital, even when they don't know what to do with it. Then what happens? You might develop new products that don't sell. You might expand your production capacity, but you have nothing to sell. Or you have expanded your cap uh, capacity and overproduced your goods, but nobody to sell to, okay? You might access new markets, 
just to find there are no customers. Because what uh, you took to be a new market, you did not do enough research to justify external funding. So before you think of external funding, because even those who are going to, to give you money, they are also in business. And there is no money that is for free in this world. So before you do that, you have to invest heavily in uh, market research so that you can know uh, the market, you know what uh, goods or products you have to develop, you know what capacity you need, you need know if you have to access new markets and so on. And I believe uh, through the marketing uh, presentation, you discussed various ways of uh, market segmentation, uh, you know, market differentiation and such uh, strategies to justify capital. So two com uh, key components of, uh, that influence a business investment readiness, we have business viability and the quality of investor materials. And viability is what I've discussed that you can only do no business viability through market research. And the market research is not a must to use questionnaires because this is a question we get from very small businesses. Somebody tells you, I sell, I sell sweets uh, in Nairobi at Kencom. Now, when you tell me market research, I, I, I don't know what you mean. Market research, you can just walk through town and uh, do random questions on the other corners of town uh, to assess the demand. You can be able to see how many people are also selling sweets on the other side of town. It doesn't have to be complicated because those in small businesses, they always perceive market research to be elitist. It is not elitist. It is doable. You through even observation, you can be able to observe through random questions, through just uh, seeing how you know the goods are available in other parts of the world, parts of town. You know, you can be able to do simple uh, market research even without a questionnaire. Because if your business is not viable, then you will not be a candidate for investment readiness. I think that's very clear. If your business is not viable, you won't be a candidate for investment, uh, more investment, because you land yourself in more troubles with business capital owners. So uh, quality of invest investor materials are the documents that you'll need, and we shall look at them shortly. So what are the aspects of investment uh, readiness? As I have uh, indicated, there are two, basically. There is business viability, and, that, and we have the investor materials. Now, with business viability, the first very crucial item is the, the business model. What is your business model? Now, when we talk of a model, is how do you make your money? How does your money come back? Because if anybody is to trust you with their uh, capital, you have to demonstrate that every shilling that is invested in your business will come back with an interest. So the model is very important. Number two, we have the value proposition. What value? are you marketing? What value are you selling? How unique is your product such that it will be bought by customers? How unique is your service such that it will be bought by customers and bring back our capital? Okay. 
Very important. Value proposition. What value are you selling? Because by knowing the value, you will know uh, the, 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 the level of investment to make and what is it likely to bring back to the, to the lenders or to the owners of capital. Because no capital is free. We are all in business. Number three, with business viability, you have to look at the quality of your team. Now, this one becomes a very big challenge, especially to micro businesses. Because the micros, most of them, um, or a good number of them from uh, studies, they use family members, most likely. There is nothing wrong with family members. They are good. But most of the time, the family members do not have capacity. Because there is this view about business, uh, usually at that level, that you are starting a business <laughs> to eat the business, ikusa idea. Or unanza biashara is idea, ikusa idea na isa idea familia. So the perception is that you are starting the business so that you can eat from it. So usually you use uh, relatives, you have your relatives who have uh, done with schooling, so you won't keep them busy. And so, garbage in, garbage out. You use a team that is not qualified, does not have skills, they bring down your business. So the quality of your team is very important or critical to the growth and development of your business and now um, combined with your value proposition and a, and a feasible business model, if you have a, a feasible business model, you have a unique value proposition and you have a team that is qualified. There's no reason why your business should not do well or grow. Otherwise, if you have a poor model, a poor model leads to a, a, a poor value proposition. A poor business model will be maybe poor because you have a, a weak team or a team that is not qualified or you pick relatives and put them in your business, be it a goods business, be it a service business. So it is very important to have this as the solid foundation whether you are doing a kiosk, whether you are doing Mutumba, whether you are doing a small hotel, you have to ask yourselves these three questions. What is your model? A small hotel can have a business model. These are, they, they are high sounding words, but they mean uh, something very ordinary. You can have a hotel and at the same time, you are doing outside catering. That is a model that you have a fixed hotel and you are doing uh, outside catering, okay? So one can be able to see in your business plan that you are getting income from the fixed hotel and you're also getting uh, income from outside catering. That's a model. A Mutumba business can have a, a model. You can have a, a fixed selling location you can also have a few selected uh, items, what you call a camera, which is sold to offices or sold in, uh, in estates. That's a model. So every business has a model. Others have many branches. Others are selling online, 100% online, through Facebook, through Instagram. These are all models. No matter how small a business is, every business has a model. My, 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 my business has a model because I'm also in business. When we do the kind of thing we are doing here, 
I, I am training 404 participants. So my model is I do face-to-face -face and I also do online. That's number one. I do training for corporates. I do business for individuals. I do training for individuals and small groups. And all of them come with different uh, payment structures. You see, that's my model. So I do online and I do physical. I also categorize, I also segment my customers. So if I want uh, capital, that's what I'll place as my model. Okay, good. The next very important aspect of investment readiness is the investor materials. And these are business plans, uh, the financials, and the memoranda that we are going to develop with the owners of capital. Now, this is why we started uh, different, uh, business planning in my uh, earlier presentation. And we looked at the parts of a business plan, why you need a business plan, and uh, how you write it out and why it is done. And we say that you cannot communicate anything about your business without a solid documentation of your business on paper, what we call a business plan. You needed to yourself also to understand your business because you can see your strategies, you can uh, be able to market your strategies. Like now when I'm talking about a business model value proposition, you are going to put it in the business plan, okay? Because that is a communication of business. We communicate through business plans. No matter how small a business is, it should have a business plan. The reason because this business is meant to grow. If it doesn't, is not meant to grow, then it's a fixed mindset business and it cannot grow because you're also not growing. I know that, I know that is harsh, but that is, that is the reality. That if you are operating a business without a business plan, you can't know where you are coming from and where you are going. You cannot be able to present your business idea to anybody even to a small circle, you cannot. So one of the most crucial investor materials is a business plan. And it is very crucial. We also have the financial uh, models. A business does not, know, does not have uh, financials. It's a business that you can know where it is moving from and where it is going. It's a business you cannot even uh, analyze whether it needs capital or not. And so the chances of growth are limited. And uh, most likely such a business is run with a fixed mindset. And with a fixed mindset, you can't know where you are coming from and where you are going. Good. So the, the, that very important investor material in investment readiness is the memoranda. These are the documents you are going to, to develop with the owners of capital uh, and agreements that you are going to develop. And this should be robust and make a compelling case for investment in your business, okay? So these are the two crucial areas or two crucial aspects of investment readiness. Now, um, capital uh, accumulation has a process that is composed of many steps. And uh, I'm going to present to you uh, nine steps 
in three uh, phases. And the first uh, three steps are called uh, or referred to as preparation phase of uh, capital accumulation. The next three steps are about investor enge in engagement. And uh, the final three steps are about uh, deal closure and disbursement uh, disbus of capital. So these nine steps are the ones that are usually followed by investors. Even banks, they follow these steps to assess your business so that you are able to access capital. They might, they might not be nine, but loosely, they follow this kind of process. There is a preparation phase. There is the investor engagement phase. And there is a deal closure and disbursement uh, phase. So I'm going to look at them uh, one by one. And we shall see what falls uh, one by one in every step of the way. Number one is to identify the capital need. Most uh, businesses, especially the small ones that have, that have not had a very good experience, they are not good at identifying their capital need. Or what they identify as needs might not be needs. And so, it's very important to understand what capital needs are. And number one, you have to look at the growth strategy to know what a level of capital needed by the business. And that's why when you want more capital for business, the investors or the, the, the owners of capital, we look at your growth strategy. We look at your business plan because that is where you read the business strategy. Your business growth strategy will show how you get your money, how the revenues come in. We look at your costs. Okay, and you look at the growth projection over some time, maybe two to five years. And if they are convinced that that strategy is feasible, then immediately they will see that your business requires capital. Then in a business, the capital must be targeted to a specific uh, initiative because capital is required for many uses, okay? No matter the size of business, maybe you want capital to expand your production because you have uh, more customers who want the product. Maybe you don't want to expand production. You want to expand sales initiatives. Okay. Maybe you want to open more branches. Maybe you want to overhaul the, the whole machine and install a high capacity machine, like what we have seen in um, uh, uh, beer companies and uh, soda bottling companies. Sometimes because of the level of clientele, sometimes there's need for a complete overhaul to increase your production capacity because your market demands so. You may want to have capital to expand employment of skilled workers to produce the goods that the market needs. So as a business person, you have to be very careful where you won't put your money because you might put your money 
where it doesn't function. For example, if you are selling Mutumba, and I want to use a very small case of a Mutumba uh, operator, you may want capital so that you can uh, have more selling outlets. In, instead of just doing it in Gekomba, you might decide to, uh, to open more outlets or stores in Gedurai, Kawangware, Ilimuru, Tengera, and so on. That is an expansion strategy. You want to open up new stores. So you need some materials to construct. You need uh, maybe employees. That's a, that's a growth strategy. That's an initiative. You may want capital to increase stock. Maybe there's the same stock you sell, or you want to sell a higher grade stock. From Tumba, what you call camera. Maybe you want to graduate from these others and you want now to go to more quality uh, clothes. That's an initiative. Maybe you want to money so that you can have stock to take to estates. That's an initiative. So it doesn't matter how small or big a business is. The, the business principles are the same. The third and a very important aspect to look at is to assess whether the operations can be funded internally and the time to do it. One of the unwritten rules of uh, capital accumulation, especially when you want to use external funders or external investors, is that you should also have your own capital. Why do you want to risk everybody's capital and you, you have nothing to lose? Why do you want to take 10,000 to start a business a 10,000 loan, and you don't have a single shilling inside there. So if it doesn't work, who loses? You have nothing to lose. So there's a quiet rule of uh, capital that when you go for a million shillings, you should also have your, you know, like 20% of yours to convince even the investor that if things don't work, you'll also lose. And that is very important. It's a very good convincing uh, strategy, even when you go for loans in banks. Have something on your own. Say, I want 100,000, but I have my 50. I want a million, but I have my 600, or I have my 200. Because you should also have some level of risk. The final point on identification of capital need is the time, the timing when you need that capital. Because a business is a cycle. And those of you in business know, and I know you are all in business, all the 425, you know that business has a cycle. There's a time it is low, there's a time it is high. Those who sell uh, beverages, those who sell fruits in town, they know between June and August, the sales are low because it is cold. Because when it is cold, people don't buy drinks. Cold drinks, they, they buy hot drinks. So when is, this, when is the best time to go for capital? It's not when the business is low. It's when you are just about to start the high season. Those of you in the uh, tourism industry, and the related businesses. You know that uh, tourism in Kenya picks up in the second, the fourth quarter of the year from August to December, because that is when we have uh, winter on the other side. So if you want to inject capital, you inject when the revenue time has come, the high season has come. Otherwise, if you are going to inject, you want to, 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 to increase the number of beds for the hotel, 
in January, when the season is ending, you'll have a very hard time repaying capital. So the timing is very important. Whether a business is small, whether a business is big. If you are selling fruits, you know you start your business or you get more capital when it is hot. Because when it is hot, people buy more fruits, people drink more juice. Okay? And so on. Every, every business has its high point and end point. So to identify the need, the timing must be just right. So that is step one. Step number two is to develop investor materials. And one of the most crucial materials, and we looked about this last time, is a business plan. And today I've talked extensively about the need, the need for a business plan. No matter how small a business is, you cannot understand it until it is written down. The financials are documented. You have an idea what you get at the end of the day. You can be able to project what you can get next month, three months, six months, and so on. A business plan is the only document that can be put on the table because an investor might not be able to visit so many invest uh, so many businesses on site and even if you visit uh, on site there is nothing you can tell you until you see the revenues that come in and what remains as profit until you see the strategies that are in place until you see the growth plan to understand how your money will come back it is very hard to be convinced that the justification for lending money is right. So a business plan is a must. In that business plan, there will be the financial model or how is your finances, how are your finances growing? What is your model for financial uh, inflows? And I used a very simple example of somebody selling sweets. How do you make your money? If you are selling sweets, you should have an idea how much profit you make per packet, how much shillings you make per piece. Because from there, we can be able to calculate the number of pieces, um, a number of uh, uh, packets you sell in a day, the number of cartons. We can be able to project in a year how much money you can make in a year. Very simple business. Very simple document. And that's the document one you can table and say, I want 10,000. Because every month I want to increase the number of packets. Maybe I want to employ more people, uh, like those uh, people who sell sweets in buses in the, on, on, in the traffic jam. I want to have more people entering more buses and, of course, selling more. There's a justification you can use that every packet, you buy a sweet, I get one shilling. So if I can increase to a thousand uh, packets, I can get this much money. And, and that way, I'll be able to employ this number of people and be able to pay them maybe by piece rate and so on. So a financial model must be structured out. And it doesn't matter the kind of business you are doing. Every business the difference between a difference and another one is simply the level of capital in injected. Nothing more. The ideas are the same. There is no business that is bigger than the other one. What is bigger is the articulation of the business. If you are selling a suite, you're just like someone selling a car. So know that your suite is one shilling and the car is a million. But the principles are the same. The difference is just the level of capital injection. So the investor material, the business plan, a financial model will help you now to develop what we call an investor pizza. A pizza is just a one page document that is used to introduce an acquisition or investment opportunity to strategic or financial buyers. You can have a one pager summarizing the need for capital injection or capital uh, um, accumulation or requests from investors. 
So that one pager leads to a more detailed investor memorandum that we are going to write out with the identified investor. And eventually you are going to sign at a later stage. So to end the, the first phase, um, you have to consider the capital structure. And the capital structure of your business is composed of several items. Number one, the internal funding. The ones I've just, uh, I've just talked about a few minutes ago. What are the internal funds that are being used in this business? Because some investors would like to match a shilling and a shilling, a dollar and a dollar. So if I'm going to give you a million, you should also have your own. Others will say, if you are going to invest a million, you must have at least 20% internal funds because of distribution of risk. You cannot be able to operate a business very well when you have nothing to lose. You borrow a million from a bank and you have nothing to lose when it, if it sinks. So the capital structure of your business is important to show the level of internal funding so that to justify the level of income. Also, you might be looking for an investor when you're already having external funding, okay? It's good also to know because when you also have other debts, what does it mean? It means that the level of risk goes up. Uh, we have been having a very interesting uh, scenario in Kenya where in the last 10 years, we have accumulated quite a number of uh, loans from external investors. Um, I don't want to say they are good or bad because a loan is as good as what it is used for. And uh, these are the questions that you'll be asked by external donors. What is your, what is your what is your tax? How much ta tax do you collect? Those are internal funding sources. Then they are going to look at your, do you have other loans which you are servicing? Yes. What does that mean? That if you're servicing others, you also have a challenge uh, servicing mine. They look at what you use the money for. And that has been the biggest debate in Kenya in the last 10 years that we are using money in capital, in, in capital infrastructure. It will be very important in uh, so many years to come. It is uh, uh, going to help so many people to start businesses. That's fine. Until we prove that theory, uh, we, 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 we may, it might be a theory for now, but after the infrastructure in, is in place, you cannot hide the impact. So most probably it's going to have a very high impact for starting businesses, farmers being able to take their goods to the market and so on. So you look at your internal uh, sources, like a country, you look at the, 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 the level of uh, taxes they are able to collect per year. Do they have other, uh, other debts they are servicing? So you look at the capital structure. Then, Management should consider the cost of capital and the intended use. Cost of capital is the interest that you are paying. Again, we have been having a very big de debate in Kenya about the sources of our loans. There are those who say that, well, let's have more loans from World Bank and uh, IMF because their tax, their, their interest is lower. Others say, let's get other loans from other sources, even if their interest is high. Cost of capital is very important because 
especially for uh, small um, businesses, there is a tendency to go for very high cost of capital from, um, uh, what do you call these people on the street? Uh, Shylocks. Shylocks lend you money at a very high interest. Interest that is not sustainable by your business. Other borrow money from circles, um, the medical routes. Medical routes, they calculate the interest per month. And you may find that per month is like 10%. 10% times 12 is 120%. You pay that loan at 120% per year. So what is your cost of that capital? The cost of capital overtakes even the funds that you have taken. That means if you're going to go for such a, a source of capital, your business cannot grow. It's very important to think about the cost of capital. So you identify uh, sources of capital that is, does not have a very high interest. We talked about the intended use of the funds. Because if you are not, if you are going to invest the money uh, badly, the returns will be low. You have to pinpoint where you want to inject that capital. If you are doing a hotel business and it is towards the end of this of the profitable cycle, that is not the time to put more beds. Because you know now there's a change over now to the low season. The beginning of low season is not the time to, to increase the number of beds. Because that season is not yielding. Even those who sell clothes, those who sell warm clothes, you know warm clothes you sell from June to August. So in September, it is not the time to invest in buying more clothes. So the intended use is very critical in the determination of capital structure. So that ends the first phase of the capital uh, accumulation uh, uh, process. Now, from there, there is a phase of investor identification and outreach. You have to choose the kind of investor that you need for your business. Because uh, sources of capital are many. And so there is need to familiarize yourself with all the investors available and what they go for. What do they invest in? Because they also have a bias. There are those who want to fund farmers. There are those who want to buy to fund uh, uh, micro enterprises. There are those who want to fund medium enterprises. There are those who want to fund, uh, you know, services. There are those who want to bring equipment. So you have to understand the kind of investors we have in the market. And know exactly what your business needs. So you have to study their networks. You have to look at databases. You have to review events. Today we have internet. You have to, what we call Googling, you have to visit internet and search, do Google search for investors. We usually have many trade fairs especially here in Nairobi and in, in, in big towns across the country, it's good to attend these fairs, depending on the kind of business that you do. So investor networks is a must to have knowledge on. So that is what will help you to reach out to them uh, and introduce yourself 
Uh, you can have an introducer who is already there with them. That is even more powerful. And get to understand what they are about and what their objectives are. Because even as they provide capital, they also have objectives. They also have goals. Because no capital is free at the end of the day. Because everybody, there's a reason that why everybody does what they do. So once you do that, then the next step is uh, conducting a due diligence. Once you have uh, profiled an investor and uh, there is some initial interest, then there is some investigation that is done or analysis of your uh, recommendation that is done to understand your business, carrying out of due diligence. In um, a wider scope, like uh, the donors we have for Kenya, that's when you'll have like investor uh, teams coming all the way from some country to come and see exactly how you are doing. If you want to invest in data sector, they'll come and visit your data sector is part of due diligence so that they can understand what is a market opportunity? What is your business model? What is your strategy? How is it likely to translate to uh, profits? And how are we, can we be able to get our money back? They'll also be conducting uh, whether you are in a uh, legal business or where your business is registered. Because especially for, you know, okay, all types of businesses, you might be thinking you are lending money to uh, a genuine business person, just to find that maybe they are involved in, uh, you know, other activities that are not allowed by law. And that is why due diligence, if you are, is important. If you are doing a business that involves land, is the land acquired properly? Does it have papers, you know? So all this data is secured in a data room. Or these days we have online storage platforms so that they are easily accessible by investors and uh, they are uh, traceable, you know, from that uh, website or online uh, platform. So due diligence is done in a very big way, even for small lenders. By the way, even when you are taking these online uh, loans that have become very popular today, there is some information that you give them, like your location, what you sell. You need an introducer. Who, 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 you know, in case we don't get you, whom do we get? Your phone number. This, this information uh, is uh, very useful, but uh, it might look like ordinary information, but it's not ordinary. One, your phone number. When you have your phone at any one time, if somebody wants to know where you are at any one time, it's very pos it's possible to know. So if you take uh, money for business and you lie that you work in Nairobi, uh, and uh, your phone number is always in Bogoma, then they are able to trace. So don't take it for granted. Your phone number is not for granted. Physical address is not for granted. And by the time they lend you money, they know they can get you if they want. So they have done their maths. They have done their uh, due diligence. Before they brought that uh, package where you can 
get money online. They did their diligence and they know possibly if there is a level of default, maybe it's two to five percent, others will pay. So due diligence. So there is still further due diligence that is done to investigate your internal documents, to investigate your past performance. Have you ever handled that kind of money? If you want a million shillings, do you have experience spending that kind of money? Have you ever taken that kind of money from another investor? How did you make use of it? And how do you project to use the uh, investment money that you want now? This has to be, uh, your documents must be very well interrogated. Are you involved in tax evasion, for instance? Because an investor can lend you money. Then um, tomorrow, you realize that your business is illegal or does not submit tax. And possibly the KRI has caught up with you and uh, put you in or taken your goods or auctioned your goods. Who loses? Is the investor. So there is a lot of uh, interrogation of documents. And that is why before you start in a business, there's a lot of information that is taken from you. And that is why all that information should be as genuine as possible. So that uh, you, it, everybody can know that you are a truthful business person, no matter the size of business, whether you are selling sweets, selling tumba, uh, having a matato, it has to be a kind of business that is beyond reproach. So that uh, you, you, your credit rating is good. By the way, they even investigate whether you have ever been uh, with the CRB and, and such institutions so that they can know whether you are good at repaying your money. So this is the further due diligence that is done for new to make sure that if you are given some capital, the owners of capital can get their money back, perhaps with the interest that they also need so that we can have a win-win. They have helped your business to grow and uh, they have got their interest because there's nothing for free in this world. We are all in business. So when all that is done now, you are going to negotiate a term sheet. And the term sheet is uh, that uh, negotiation uh, sheet that you're going to develop. And uh, this one is going to be developed. If it's a big business, we have the senior management. If it's a small business, then the business owner or the company owner. So now we go to the next level now of negotiations now. So the term, uh, the term sheet is a document that outline, outlines what we are going to agree on. The terms and conditions. And uh, these terms of conditions are very important, especially for the investor to understand what every term is about. Because you could have some investors that uh, once you have their money, you commit yourself that you're not going to take any other loan from anywhere. You can have an investor who brings you equipment and uh, gives you a condition maybe that uh, you should always, if you want any other equipment, you have to buy from them. You have to study the terms and conditions very, very carefully. We always make fun about terms and conditions that they are written in a very small font. Make sure you're not able to read. 
but arm yourself with a magnifying glass if you can, because we say the devil is always in the detail. And it's very important to understand these terms of course, some could be limiting you. Yeah. You can get a loan from an investor that commits you that all the uh, repairs must come from them. You know, all, you know, if you want any repair, it's a condition you have to buy from them. You have to get uh, the person coming to the artisan or the fundi from them. You know, there has been a lot of discussion in Kenya, even about uh, the kind of roads you are making and uh, and the infrastructure, you wonder why um, maybe we, we, we constructing a road. Then you find the spades are also coming from the small things that are abused, the spades and wheelbarrows and these small items. Possibly they are coming from the same person who is writing new capital. It is in the detail. So it's a very important when you're negotiating for a term sheet to know exactly what the details are about. And the exclusivity clauses that prevent businesses from soliciting other investors. So you can be locked in in a relationship that by the end of the day, by the end of the day might uh, do some harm or make your credit more expensive so it's always good to know so then there is a closing of the investment and the investment so the term sheet is uh, finalized and eventually there is an investment agreement that is usually uh, done through legal experts on your part and the part of the owner of capital and it sets out a few things. Number one, the capital commitment. The capital commitment is what is the capital being used for? For how long? When do you start repaying? Uh, how will it be done? What are the terms and conditions? If it is not in money form, it is in equipment form. How is it going to be serviced? By who? Uh, guarantee, you know, because you can negotiate in such a way that maybe if there are any repairs to be done the first two, three, four years, maybe there is no extra charge. This is at the level of commitment. What are you committing yourself to? Number two, there is a timelines especially for repayment and for implementation. Timelines for implementation, because some investors would like also to know how you are progressing and maybe the capital is not a one-off. Maybe it's, it's pegged to progress, but you said you are going to open an extra shop, we, we, we give you a hundred thousand. You said you are going to employ another two, um, uh, freelance, freelance uh, salesmen or salespersons, we add another 50,000. You said you are going to open another branch outside town, you know, sometimes it is pegged to performance. So those timelines are very important to you and the investor. And they are documented in your closing uh, agreement. As usual, there are terms and conditions of the investment. Because at the end of the day, terms and conditions apply all the time. And when they apply, there is no case of ignorance that I didn't do this because I did not understand the agreement because you have signed on the dotted line. Let alone you cannot feign ignorance. You cannot say you didn't know so these three are very important, the capital commitment and uh, how it is being utilized as agreed, timelines and terms and conditions.
Then finally is the execution of the plan. So uh, it can be short term or long term. As I have remarked earlier, uh, some investors deploy capital in tranches and all this has to be in your agreement. And in that agreement, there is also, uh, you have agreed on how you are going to uh, deliver or said uh, progress reports. And these reports highlight your operations and the key performance indicators, like the ones I've, have, I've just enumerated. If you agreed you are going to open a new branch, has it been opened? You see, you said you are going to employ new staff uh, who are technically sound, did you do it? These are key performance indicators. Uh, if you said you are going to uh, you know, uh, improve the level of stock, did you do it? It's a key performance indicator. You increased from this to that. And this is not just for big businesses, even very small businesses. Selling suites, did you increase the number of packets? Did you increase the number of outlets? Did you increase the number of uh, you know, in, uh, sellers? Those could be key uh, performance indicators for a very small business. So this applies to all businesses. So with that now, we close that part uh, of the nine steps of uh, you know, capital accumulation. And we look at now the dimensions of investment readiness. When can we say you are investment ready? Once again, this has nine uh, steps to be investment uh, ready or to feel or to be ready. You can uh, say you are ready for uh, external investment from an investor. The first one is a review of the market uh, landscape. The second one is on uh, business model, the quality of the team, the history or traction to date, the historical performance up to date. Once again, the growth strategy. I think you're mentioning growth strategy now for uh, many times. I'm sure it was also mentioned and uh, explored in marketing. <clears throat> then the capital need, the level of capital needed, governance, and finally the uh, anticipated impact or envisaged impact. So once again, you look at them one by one. Under market landscape, uh, you, you look at the target ma uh, market size, you look at the product service demand, you look at the competition, you look at the barriers to your business or to market uh, entry and regulatory environment. In short, and this you must, uh, we, 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 we look at it in business planning, you looked at it in, in marketing, the target market. What is your target market? This one is going to be interrogated to understand the need for capital. What is your product service demand? Do we have competitors? How is the industry? How is the regulatory environment? There are some businesses today that are in uh, an environment that is too regulated. And uh, those in it, they keep complaining about the level of regulation. I'll give you an example. In the last one year, we have, a, we have had a very big problem with the scrap metal business because it has been uh, assumed that dealers of scrap metal are getting materials from uh, vandalized uh, projects, government projects. So recently that business was even closed, closed for some few months. And there was a lot of hue and cry from those dealers because suddenly you're operating a business and by six o'clock in the evening, it is closed. So it brought a lot of suffering. 
So if you are a scrap metal dealer and you go for an investor, he'll be very cautious because as much as it has been allowed back, nobody knows whether it's going to be closed again tomorrow. The same with alcohol business. We have heard a lot of hue and cry about alcohol business. Uh, so, and these are just examples. The industry is good, but the regulatory, <clears throat> regulatory environment is having contentions because of various issues and they are very genuine issues. So the significance of looking at market landscape is to assess the market availability, or if you can, is there a significant market for your, for your, for your product? And an investor will be very interested to know if your market is significant. If you be having if you are going to invest in your scrap metal business, then tomorrow again it's closed. So you are not getting money, you cannot pay back, and you cannot blame anybody. You know? So market landscape is important. We also have the business model, once again, business model. And these are areas like the production processes the value chain partnerships, the product itself, the distribution uh, channels, the customer outreach. Is your product having a market? How is it production processes? How are your relationships in the value chain? How are distribution uh, channels? How is the customer outreach? The reason why this is important, especially for goods that require a heavy investment in production, is because investors don't just invest in cash. We have investors who invest in equipment. There are those who invest in um, technical advice yeah like they can send if you're producing beer for example no let me use a very simple products like uh, if you are making juice an investor can invest in uh, bringing a technical person who is good in nutrition so that can be able to advise uh, which you should which one you should mix with which one uh, expiry dates, uh, which cannot, which two juices cannot be mixed because of your acetic or alkalinic compositions. That's a technical person. So investment is not just money. It can be equipment, can be technical, it can be money. And so all this fits in the business model. And also, how are you able to reach customers? The significance of this is because we need to understand your internal and external risks that are associated with your business. Okay. The next one, the next dimension is your team and organizational structure. How competent is, are your workers, for example? Because competence translates in, in production, competence manifests even in marketing and in product development. So an investor will be interested to know just how good and productive is your team. Because competences are going to translate to profit. Profit, uh, profit is going to translate to ability to repay the capital. And so all that assessment of competences from uh, uh, senior management to all the people dealing with the staff dealing with the product. How is the employment retention, for example? 
Are you in a kind of industry that you see uh, no employee does one year? So that's another very important dimension. And as I said at the beginning, most of the small businesses don't do very well in this part because there's a tendency to invest in uh, poorly qualified staff or relatives who come in with very different expectations. Some don't have a, a skill and uh, at the same time, they have come to benefit from the business because most of the very small business startups, they start businesses to eat them. Wananza biashara waikulie as they put it. So they don't have to put so much effort. You start a kiosk that you can eat from it. And surely within a very short time, the kiosk is gone. Of course you have eaten it now. So small businesses are couplets in uh, staffing because they don't invest in very qualified uh, uh, staff. And that is a very big failure. So if we're investing in poorly qualified staff, what it means is that not many investors would like to invest in that kind of a setup. And we have seen even big industries. We have seen even big supermarkets coming down because of uh, disagreements between brothers and sisters. Very big brands have come down. So if you are an investor, and uh, such an entity comes to you for uh, injection of capital. And you look at it and see this is composed of brothers and sisters. So what is the likelihood that they, will, they won't have a diversion from uh, what made them start the business? And sure enough, we have seen very big, big brands coming down because of problems in organizational structure and the team. So if a big one can come down, then the small ones will have gone. So this is very uh, significant because investors are able to identify whether business employees and management have the required competencies to run the business. Being a relative is not a competence. That is a, a natural happening. But competences must be demonstrated. The next very useful dimension of investment readiness is a historical performance. Or how have you been performing? How has been your sales, for instance? You want capital from us. How has it how has your sales been like? Of course, you can only learn this through documents. So your financial documents must be sound. How has been your customer base? Is it documented? How has been your gross and net margins? How has been your cash flows? Because cash flows have a a bearing on how soon I can get my money back. Because investment money is not free money. How soon can I get my money back? I can tell that from the cash flows that you are able to, you know, display. So this way, the investor is able to understand your historical data and the history informs future. So if you have been doing very well and consistently, and there is nothing discernible we can say that has happened now that is curtailing your business, so there's a likelihood that going forward maybe the next five years, you still be in business and uh, you'll have a business that is not interrupted. So being an investor, you look at those documents and say, I think, I think we can, we, can, we can put our money in this because you understand the history. 
and the future. Some business people, they might be small, but they have been they have they have done what they do for many years. If you have sold Mutumba for 10 years, and here is another person who has done Mutumba for six months, I would tend to believe my capital is safe with the person who has done for more years because he understands everything about our business. The history is good. Experience, super. Competences, super. Okay, so history is very, historical performance is very important as a dimension of investment readiness. The next one is growth strategy. Going forward, you have come a long way. Good, we are here now. How do you want to grow going forward? What is your company vision? And when we are looking at um, strategic uh, planning, we talked about formation of visions, missions, and so on. So now this is where it is significant. What is your company vision? What is your growth strategy? Do you have detailed business plan with execution uh, strategies? Once again, the financial projections going forward, informed by the historic ones, but now we are here going forward. How do you plan to move forward? So this is very important because an investor will see how you intend to move into, to increase your profitability. And this profitability will help you to pay back this capital that you're borrowing. An institution that is not growing definitely is dying. If you come across a business that is dying for, that is not growing for various reasons, there are those which are challenged by the level of emerging technology. There are those that have internal conflicts. There is, there are those who are not growing because maybe their staff is not competent or they are not catching up with modern ways of doing things. The reasons can be many. Mark you, uh, like, investment in technology for a business today is a must because the new business people that are coming up today the young generation the generation z we are talking about the young men and women in their 20s they are not doing business the way we used to do business they are investing heavily on online they are using facebook they are using uh, Instagram, they are using TikTok and many other platforms. And they are ready to deliver the item very fast. I was surprised to meet a Jugu seller. Today you can even be brought Jugus at home. Very surprising. Of 10 shillings, 20 shillings. It is surprising the way the new business dynamics, they are putting out the old ideas, especially in accessibility. Today, you don't have to move out of your house. You can buy something online, and the next thing you'll hear is a knock on your door. That is a powerful strategy. Okay, so how is your growth strategy? If you have such a, uh, a small business with that kind of a strategy, you can see their sales can grow because of the way they are reaching the customer. The next dimension is on capital need. What kind of capital do you need? What is your capital business capital requirement? What are the supplier arrangements that you have made before you uh, get this investment that you want? How is your payback uh, plans? How do you want to go around investing our capital? Where exactly do you need capital injection? That way, an investor is able to tell 
where exactly you need capital and what the business requires of them. Because an investor will ask themselves, what does your business require of them? Where exactly do you need their support? So you have to be very, very specific where you need capital. And I think I've talked about it before, that it could be in business expansion, they could be in investing in new skills, it could be in um, maybe migration from an, an, an analog system to a digital one. It could be it could be anything, but that is discernible and demonstrable that is going to have a positive impact in generation of more revenue or profits that are going to help you to pay back because there's no capital that is free. Then the next dimension of investment readiness is your governance. The governance of your institution or your business, no matter how small or big it is. For those big companies, they have boards of directors. For a small business, as those in micros, you have yourself as a business owner. And so the government governance structures matter if you are going if you are a sole uh, business pa a person the level of risk investing in you is very high why because you can cease to live in this world uh, some take off once they realize that uh, they are not doing very well they relocate and they go under so they took some loan in Nairobi. Then you realize you cannot repay. So the level of investment of, of, of risk is high. But for those in companies, especially those that have a solid uh, designation and location, and they are properly uh, registered investors have an easier time dealing with those ones because they already have a name and they are institutions and for those big institutions even if somebody one of person dies the business still continues and uh, there is demonstrable uh, way the way the 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 the, the, the boards of directors work they have a strategic plan there is adherence to the strategic plan there is, uh, you can look at the competencies of the, 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 the BOD or the board of directors. Uh, so governance is very important. Even when we go for state loans from outside, they assess our governance. And sometimes they make very strong recommendations before you get their capital. I remember in the early 90s, one of the conditions before we got money from World Bank, we had to do away with employees who are not very productive because this is a time that digitization was starting to take root and the internet was coming. So the internet made so many people redundant. But unfortunately, these people had been employed by government on a permanent and pensionable basis. So, it was very hard to retire them without uh, reprisals and the costly way of settlement of their pensions. So it became a very big problem because governance was a problem. Governance of parastatos that time was a very big problem because um, most of those parastatos were not making any profit. Why weren't they making profit? Because most of the boards of uh, directors were political appointees who did not have the required competences or were not committed to making money or they made money and they took it away because the, the, the ways of accounting for money were not very well um, articulated. So investors are going to invest in institutions that have a strong 
governance structures. Okay. Uh, so your business as small as it is, it should be able to demonstrate that the govern governance is solid at the implementation of uh, your, you know, your systems are a beyond reproach. It should be very clear how uh, decision making is in your in your governance, and uh, that is why this favors now the businesses that are graduating from sole proprietors to companies because companies bring bring in more verifiable structures, and um, when you have more verifiable structures, uh, the level of risk is quantifiable. And uh, it, it, it goes down. It's more than when you are depending on, you are relying on one person because a sole proprietor handles all the risk. Okay, so governance is important. Then finally, the last dimension of investment readiness is business impact. Can you be able to demonstrate that your business will have impact in the community? And how would you be able to measure that impact? Some invest, uh, investors have their interest. And interest is not always profit. Others have other good intentions. Like they, have, they are working towards some themes like reducing pollution, improving employment of youth, reducing risks uh, brought by maybe pollution. There are some very solid reasons why investors do what they do. Sometimes it's not just about money. So if your business impact is tailored and uh, resonates with theirs, then you have and you can demonstrate the social impact that your business brings to the community, you have a higher chance of getting um, 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 money from them or capital. Today, for instance, there is a very big shift to green energy. And um, many, many investors are now looking at the future where we reduce pollution by investing in green energy like solar. And um, if you are investing in that field, the future is bright because we have had very high emissions of poll uh, pollutants in the world and they are really affecting our you know, environment. We have uh, the, the climate change has come as a result of pollution. So going forward, many companies that we are going to invest in green energy are going to have many more investors than those who are doing otherwise. So very, very soon we have started seeing um, uh, cars in our market that are not, not using petrol. We are hearing very soon you are going very soon you are going to have vehicles that are not using petrol. They are already being pirated here in Nairobi. So what does that tell us? That any business whose impact is geared towards uh, natural energy or green energy and other themes that are related to that, they have a bigger future than those that are investing in um, you know, um, businesses that are going to have a negative impact maybe to environment or to social well-being of all of us. So it's upon you as a business person not to assess yourself, to assess in such a way that you can attract investment from investors. So in summary, 
Uh, we have looked at eight points in dimensions of investment readiness. And the first one is market landscape, where we talked about a clearly defined target market with the understanding of uh, risks. We have talked about the business model, which should be efficient, <clears throat> proven and efficient and implementable. We talked about team that should be competent. We've talked about traction to date. That is uh, the historical data should be accurate and should not be used to reflect or to predict uh, future. <clears throat> you are talking about the growth strategy. We should be very well defined uh, growth strategy with very detailed financials and well documented business plan. You've looked at capital need, about the defined capital requirement outlined in an investor PISA and memorandum. <clears throat> you have looked at uh, cl uh, clearly defined governance structures and mechanisms, and finally impact. That is understanding of impact with a monitoring plan, track uh, progress. So what are the benefits of investment readiness to a business like yours? One, you are able to understand your own business better because you are able to understand <clears throat> what you need or the, the capital needs of your business. And so you are able to know what you require. You know what you have, you know what you require. What does your business have? What does it require? A kind of a SWOT analysis on your business. Another benefit of investment readiness is that you can now be able to engage better with investors to raise your capital. Now you have networks that can raise capital for your business. And we have talked of all the whole landscape of investors. Those who come with liquid money, those who come with capital, uh, goods, like equipment, those who come with professionals or technical expertise, and so on. So you are able to tell, depending on number one, what you need. Now, so what do you go for? So you are able to know <clears throat> from your business need, you're able to project what you need and the kind of investors that you should have. Then investment readiness accelerates the capital raising process because now you know that <clears throat> you should have good documents updated. And you now you know the level of um, preparedness that should be in, especially in terms of papers, business plan, and uh, financials. These are very solid benefits of being investment ready to a business including a big business and a small business. A business is a business. The only difference is a capital outlay. Of course, everything that exists has its own problems. Uh, we have barriers to successful capital raise. And uh, these are categorized into two. We have the business constraints and we also have the investor constraints. Number one, business constraint is if you have a team that does not have competence. You want <clears throat> capital, but your team is not competent, or you have internal conflicts, or you have a team that is not focused because of other issues that are not business related. <clears throat> like the one I've talked about, we have seen even big corporates coming down because of internal conflicts. So those are business related um, uh, uh, factors. Number two, when your records are not very well kept, so we have vague information or wrong information or information that has been put intentionally uh, wrongly to get capital, but you have contradicting information. So vague information is very expensive because there is no investor who want to inject capital using 
information that is not correct. The next barrier is uh, growth strategies that are not backed by historical performance. Uh, if the information you are giving is not backed by your historical performance, then there is reason to doubt your information. Others give unrealistic expectations. Like you have been having, you have, you, you have, you, your sales have been a million shillings a month. Then you want to think that once you have capital injection, that you can raise to 5 million a month. It's not realistic. So growth strategies should have, should be as realistic as possible. And when you have some historical performance, it is able to bail you out and communicate the way you have come and the future you prepare to, to go. Then other barriers are investor uh, related. One, the processes are also long. You know, like uh, the due diligence can be a lengthy process that requires a lot of coordination of multiple, uh, multiple uh, partners, including lawyers and consultants. And so to be able to negotiate for um, capital is not an easy process. And we have seen it even at a national level. When we start engaging big financiers like World Bank, it doesn't end in a week or a month. We have parties coming to visit, to ground through the information we give them. Others come once again for due diligence is done like two, three, four times. Then there is a tranches that come maybe 10% with conditions. If you want to place 20%, there's some condition. All that, it is not easy, but it is doable. And uh, barriers can be many, but we are always positive when we do our part, especially for business, when you have clear records and the institutions are speaking for you, then you have no cause to worry because your background is well covered by institutions that are able to even give you um, guarantees. They can even give you recommendation because maybe you have dealt with them uh, for long and they are happy with your performance. So I want to summarize this presentation with one uh, statement by one very popular writer in business investment. It's called Robert Kiyosaki. That the secret to wealth is by using other people's time and other people's money. And uh, when we want money or, or capital from uh, investors, we are asking for other people's money. So it is not possible to grow on your own capital alone. We grow because capital is important and it's good to use other people's money to grow. That is why we, 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 we borrow and repay. We use other people's time because we employ people. So we use their expertise and we pay them by the time they invest in our business. So I want to summarize my presentation with that and now move on to a question and answer. So thank you very much at this point. So I'll request Michelle if she has picked a few questions, we can have them for the next uh, 20 or so minutes. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation, Duncan. I wish everyone enjoyed it. I can see from the chat section. Uh, we have, we do have a couple of questions on the Q and A side. Ladies and gentlemen, should you have any further questions, please let's meet at the Q and A side. That's where it will be easier to conduct the question and answer. So the, our first question is coming from Kinoti. He's he's asking. On capital structure, can we consider intellectual knowledge and concept originality as capital? And how do we then quantify IP? Aha. Uh -huh. This is a very good question. And uh, intellectual knowledge uh, and concepts, originality and innovation is very important 
And that is why we have institutions like KIPI that uh, um, secures people's innovations and the trademarks and so on. So if you have an intellectual knowledge or an innovation is good, register it so that it becomes now uh, a capital that by law you can use and they should not be replicated or stolen by anybody else. I remember there's a time uh, we had a, uh, an issue in Kenya when the Kenyan uh, Kikoi, uh, Kikoi, which is actually a Swahili terminology, it's a product from Kenya, it was discovered that it was registered by somebody, I think in China or somewhere. So if you have some inter intellectual property, there are processes to register them and secure them. And from there, you benefit from them. Those who are doing music today, they are getting some uh, some um, some money from their creativity, and uh, that is a way to go even in business. So intellectual knowledge is capital. Thank you. Great. Um, we have from Pius. Uh, he say he's asking. I have been looking for an investor for years. Where is the best place to get investors? Not everyone can get to the bank to be on, on Shark Tank or Lion's Den. Plus, how do we bear the risk on an investor stealing your good business idea for, he, for himself or herself? Great, this is a very good question, uh, Piers Egondi. From my presentation, we have seen it's good to do your part. And doing your part first is to have documents that talk about your business. Uh, most business people want to go for investment when they are not, they don't have very good uh, documents. So the first place is to have good documents. Then from there, you target, you don't target very big investors. You get, you get um, some uh, track record from uh, lenders like banks, like circles, so that accumulation of uh, experience leads to better prospects going forward. Because even investors, they look at historical data, as I've already presented, to justify a customer who is reliable. So start small, then build the portfolio. Great. Uh, Murungi is asking, can a, pass, can a person start a business with the investor in mind and, and want investor in mind and want and could could the uh well could be yeah, the benefit yeah. and what could be okay right i get it can a person start a business with investors in mind and what could be the benefits to the business yeah good question morongi dixon david yes you can start a business uh with an investor in mind but uh, a word of caution Many investors don't go for startups because it is now documented that 95% of startups don't do five years. So if you want to start a business as much as possible, get capital, uh, your own from savings um, instead of rushing to borrow because borrowing can be very expensive and the failure of business is not actually wrong. Sometimes you need those lessons to start to know to build. Duncan, we've lost you. Money in the past few years because okay. the chances of failure is there. Even if it's uh, not 100%, there are chances that you won't do well. So, as much as possible when you are starting, use your own money. Another question from Pius is how do how do we get patents for our products before we get to visit investors for pitches? Yeah, uh, a good question from Pius. Uh, this one you can just uh, get online uh, information from KIPI, and uh, that is free information. You know how to trademark, how to patent. It is all free information on uh, on internet. Read, uh, we have a question from Zuleika, it's quite long. Yes. Uh, she's saying, I really appreciate DTB's good work on yearly training. 
I enjoy the topics touching on due diligence of documents by lenders. A certain bank overrode certificate of lease and sale agreement and acted on court order. What baffles me, a court order is not abiding, uh, not abiding for lateral document to the same bank for me to qualify for a loan. Plus the court of law cannot just give orders to a bank for loans to people out of the blues. Please advise how to handle this issue. Please note the certificate was a genuine document from Ministry of Lands. Yeah, good question from Zure Zureka. Uh, there is a reason why banks exist. I mean, uh, courts exist. Courts exist to bring order. So they may not have, have doubted the genuineness of the document, but they were stopping the process to create some order or to clear, to understand better what your issue was. So uh, unfortunately, some court processes can take long. So for this one, now that it is already in the hands of court, you can only go back to court and appeal so that uh, the process can, you know, can change direction. Otherwise, there is a reason why courts exist and they exist to make our life better. But now when something gets in court, you need another court process to, to move it forward. But the, gen, uh, the, the documents are issued by genuine institutions, so they are genuine. Great. Uh, Zuleika has a follow-up comment. Yeah. There is above relates to a property account which was in dispute in court. The bank released money on court order. I believe you've answered this, Duncan. Okay, yeah, that one, uh, when it is in court now, that's a court process. It has to be approached from that direction. Great, moving on. Alvin is asking, uh, could you give us a case study of investor readiness for a local software company, which are known to have low capital requirements, but high marketing R&Ds, high, high marketing R&Ds and labor costs? Okay, that's a good question, Kato. Unfortunately, when we, we do training, uh, it's not good to cite uh, companies because uh, you can have legal uh, implications because may maybe you are portraying them in bad light. So I don't want to mention any particular company because uh, that is not good for my professional ethics. Great, uh, Monica is asking, can you please explain the due diligence process in depth? Uh, well, um, I've talked about it uh, briefly, but generally it's about understanding you, the investor, about uh, you as a person. How are you registered in the country? Do you have an ID? Do you pay taxes? Uh, if you're, it's about land, you have to look at the registration of titles. You have to look at uh, the genuineness of the, the large transactions. Do you pay? They even go to maybe see a bit, find out if you have been blacklisted. All that is diligence. And whether you have been paying, paying taxes, whether your business has any criminal record, whether you have a criminal record yourself, diligence is all that process to be sure that you are dealing with the right customer and the right customer is doing genuine business and is able to repay the investor's money. Anything between that is diligence, is due diligence. Right. Um, we have Amana. Amana is asking, is there anyone working on ESG readiness for sustainability finance and investments? Yeah, Amana, this is a good question. Is there anyone working on ESG readiness? Yeah, this one is easy to find out um, and uh, get information from uh, those concerned. Would you be able to mention <laughs> For her. Uh, no, because uh, this is a very specific question. I would also need yeah. to, 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 to find out myself uh, because uh, what we say here should be verifiable and uh, correct. That's uh, true. Left when a doubt. Yeah. That's true. Great. Uh, Enoch is asking Can I uh, quantify my current business stock and market scope as a capital? Yes, uh, business stock is part of capital. Market scope 
is a, is a, is strategy. And we have already looked at that presentation and see it, seen that one of the areas that are, are assessed is your market scope. So business is capital, a good market scope, and the way you go about accessing that market raises your chances of getting capital because it's verifiable and you're able to put a case that is verifiable that you can get capital and repay. Great. Caleb wants to just mention he, this is a wonderful session and he has follow-up questions. Mm. What are the steps to determine readiness for investing? That's one of the questions. Uh, and what are the most successful investment strategies mm. and which of, which of the readiness levels are subjective? We have already, our uh, Caleb, we have already looked at the steps. Uh, if you participated in the whole presentation, so the steps are there of in, in investor readiness. We looked at eight of them. We have looked at nine steps. Uh, what are the most successful investment strategies? Uh, those ones are covered largely in the presentation because it's now upon up now you, how do you do it yourself now? How is your business? The success is not about the steps. It's about your business readiness. And if it qualifies in all those aspects to get capital. So now it's about now your case now. Which of uh, the readiness levels are subjective? Um, as much as possible, everything is very objective. Objective because uh, those who give capital, they're also in business. They also have their business objectives. So every tool they use is as objective. They cannot uh, be subjective because they are also in business and to be as objective as possible. Good. Uh, Caleb, I hope we've answered your questions. Uh, Barbara is asking on the value of the team, how does a startup uh, start with a credible team while struggling with business capital? <laughs> this is a very good question, one boy. Um, when you start a business, start a business where you are competent in. That's number one. Because many businesses we have are a copy paste. And the copy paste, even if you got capital, it will go to waste because you are not competent. So if you are a sole proprietor and you want to start a business, start a business that you understand, that you are competent in. Invest time to go and learn about it. If you don't go to college, you can go and take time and sit with somebody who is running a similar business for a month, two months, so that you understand how that business goes. Don't rush to look for capital. It will go down to waste. Go for skills first. Once you have skills, then capital will go to good use. Yep. Good. Kelvin is asking, if the potential investors get interested in my business and agree to invest, am I going to lose ownership? Given that I am using their money, what if they want the shares as well? <laughs> A very good question. Um, you're not going to lose your business, but you should watch out what you sign for in your terms and conditions. I have seen uh, many uh, women groups out there. They go for loans from, from banks and uh, circles. Then they put their uh, items of trade as security. You have a shop uh, or your household items as security. And definitely when you are not able to pay, your items are auctioned. So what you sign on the dotted line and the terms and conditions, read them, understand them. And if there is one that needs adjustment, you, you, you agree at that point. Otherwise, you may not lose your business, but it can affect your business if you are not able to repay. And uh, what will be used is the terms and conditions, because if you agreed that you are not, if you are not able to repay the, equip, the equipment, it is picked and it is actually picked. Even if you go to court, what you signed for is binding because you had agreed and you have uh, sane mind and everything. So you are going to lose. And we have seen people lose furniture, lose business, lose vehicles. You have seen vehicles being 
uh, auctioned and picked from the roads because of what you signed for. So be worried what you sign for. Great. Enoch is asking, if one director of the company has had issues with digital platform loan, loan lenders, can that affect the company capacity to acquire loans? Good question, Keitani. Today, there's something that is happening uh, very interesting about our digital world. If you have a digital loan, it is very verifiable when you are doing other transactions because now these things are interconnected now. Your ID number is interconnected with the items you are buying, your KRA certificate. So yes, it can affect because it's very easy to verify uh, if you're having issues with other lenders. And that is actually why CRB exists to make you to have that database. And uh, before people transact with you, they check if you are having issues with, you have a, a bad loan repayment history. So yeah, it can affect your capacity. Right, moving on. Josephine is asking, would you recommend amending a business plan for purposes of acquiring loans for expansion? Yeah, Josephine, yes, you can amend. A, a business plan is a living document that should be updated every now and then. But if you are going to amend to put wrong information, please don't do. Be as genuine as possible because uh, amending with the incorrect information will not help you in the long run. You will become another uh, cheat and uh, you'll, bad, you'll have a bad history with investors. So be as genuine as possible. Great. Uh, Vivian is asking, I have a counseling startup. I have a challenge with pricing. My mm. partner is always giving a discount or reducing the price of a session, which is not viable. How do I handle that? because I believe consistency in pricing is key. Ah, this is a very good question, but it's a marketing question. Now, uh, Vivian, uh, what you do is now you target a market state, uh, segment that favors your business. You can target a different, uh, it's like you are targeting the same clientele with your competitor. So. You can never sweep competitors out of this world. So uh, change your strategy. And uh, one strategy you can change is your segmentation. You can decide to deal with a certain class of uh, customers, maybe those who can afford your high price and you focus on that. Don't waste uh, put too much time on the others. So it's a marketing question and marketing strategy question. Right. Um, we have someone asking if they could view the last slide. George, if you could just go back to your last slide as we continue with answering the questions. Duncan. Okay. Uh, just a minute. This one. Uh, is that wrong? That's... Could I view the last slide? Hopefully that's what she yeah. wants to know, George. I hope that's the slide you wanted to see. Uh, meanwhile, Brian is asking, how do we get investors in gold business? Uh, hmm. Gold business? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> well, personally, I don't have you know, information on, uh, that's a very specific question in gold business. Uh, so you need a lot of information gathering. So uh, go to uh, gold dealers, collect a lot of information, search on the web, search on, um, do a lot of Google search on all, you can get information about gold business. Uh, talk to dealers that you know, then you start working from there. Great, Daniel is asking, what is the main factor that affects investments? Daniel, the main factor that affects information, uh, investment is incompetence. We have many, many, many business people that are not competent for the businesses that they do. 
So the first step to a business is to be competent and to understand it. Number two, you should have passion in that business. Number three, don't target, problem, uh, don't target profit. Target the positive change that your business can create for many people. Not, not just get a markup. Target what benefit it will bring to many people. And everything else will fall into place. Great. Uh, Pius is also asking, how do we deal with investors who are only willing to assist with stiff terms that even go against your business model? Uh, Pius, that's a very good question. Sometimes we have seen it even at the national level when we have investors or donors who come with the terms. You want the money, yes, but uh, we have terms like you must retrench, you must do business this way, you must do business that way. Uh, what you can do is just look for those that don't have many conditions. Um, because as you say, some, some can even force you to almost change your business model to reflect what they want to see. So you have to choose between your business model and the money, because most of the time, we are uh, uh, like de uh, desperate for the money. But as much as possible, look for those that are aligned to the vision of your business. Otherwise, if you change your course, it will be very hard to come back because it will affect your business. So stick to your guns, look for those that are uh, appropriate for your kind of vision. Good. Patrick is asking, at what point does an investor pitch, pitch deck come in play? Um, in, in negotiation, that is when this comes to play because you'll have to present, of course, with very convincing uh, uh, data about your business, how it is viable. And once it is demonstrable that your business is viable from historical performance, and uh, realistic projections, then uh, pitching will be successful. Great. Uh, we have Shaheen asking, hi, I have a dairy startup with contracts. However, if we wish to expand, we will need capital injection as the model has been successful now for a year. Do standard banks give loans or do we have to approach agricultural banks? It's a good question, uh, Shaheen. Uh, what I would say, just approach them, approach all those banks and uh, see what they have to offer and you pick what works for you. But congratulations also for having a good startup, which is doing well. Great, that's nice. Uh, we have someone here asking, if, if one wants to start a business where one can get information on where the firm is to register and get the concerned licenses since this I don't think I'm getting this right. If one wants to start a business, where can one get information on where the firm is to register and to get the concerned licenses since this seems endless? Yeah, this is a question uh, from entrepreneurship and uh, registration of businesses. Companies uh, get information on how to register companies uh, from the attorney general's uh, chambers, uh, how to register uh, sole proprietorships, yeah, this is free information on the internet. Then you familiarize yourself with the taxes that go with it. And that may vary from county to county because we have taxes that go to KRA. We have those licenses and the single business permits that are controlled by counties. So it's good to familiarize because there could be quite a number depending on the business we are doing. Great, Barbara is asking, uh... She has a comment, she says, that was a very good presentation. How can one reach you for mentorship? Is it a product you offer or would you consider? Uh, to offer, to, to reach me for, um, for mentorship uh, on this, when you get this right, you'll get my uh, email address. So we can start it off there. And we see which direction, understand the direction you'd like us to go. 
Yes. Barbara, at the end of the presentations, once you get the presentation on your email tomorrow, uh, Duncan's contacts and email address will be on it. Yes. Great. Enoch is asking, what's the what's advisable investor? What's the advisable investor cost interest percentage ceiling that is viable for businesses to flourish without stress and strain? Ah, this is a very good question, Enoch. Um, investors' uh, terms and conditions and interest rates differ. So there is no ceiling as long as, well, of course, the higher the interest, the more it affects your business. But it could be high interest with a very long period again, where maybe you'll have made a lot of money. So you look at the interest level and the, the, the other terms to make a sound decision what works for your business. But guard your business. Sorry, I was mute. <laughs> okay. Daniel is asking, kindly recommend a marketing structure for startups other than sales teams. Um, Daniel, um, I don't want to recommend a certain marketing structure, but I would recommend that you study a lot of them so that you can see what works for your business because no business is like any other. And the structures differ depending on uh, on the kind of business. So I don't know how you are, what you as is a business you are in. So familiarize yourself with a lot of marketing information uh, so that you can be informed and what informs your business, uh, what works for your business, you can be able to choose. Great. Uh, we have someone asking, how do I calculate percentage when engaging in when engaging investors? Uh, techno common. Uh, how do I calculate percentage? I don't know. Percentage of what? Is it uh, percentage profit? I don't know. This is um, this this uh, you are going to agree on how your repayment uh, percentage, if that is how you interpret the question. This is all you are going to agree with your investors. And I have said in a previous question, it it could be high interest, but could have, maybe it has advantages like a long time to uh, you have been provided. Maybe there's a grace period of six months. There are so many factors to look at before you sign the, doc, the, the dotted line. So it's always good to know, see what works for your business. That is, should be paramount. Great. Uh, someone, Anonymous is asking, for business negatively impacted by the emergence of new technology, such as cyber cafes, movie stores, is there a comeback plan for them? Is there a need to invest further in them? <laughs> a good question, Anonymous. Well, if you cannot beat them, join them. Uh, technology has come. And I've even said that even myself, I used to Zoom for the first time in March. So if your technology and way of life is dying, please uh, think twice before you keep on uh, investing in technology that it will not be there tomorrow. So why not just change your technology and you compete with others? Good. Uh, Franklin is asking, how will you advise a businessman who owns a small business and wants to purchase a motorcycle majorly to ease in his movements? Ah, Franklin, that's a good question. I don't know how small, your, how small is your small business but if your motorcycle is going to bring in more revenue and uh, it will be able to impact on revenue very well, uh, then you can go for it. But uh, no motorcycle also comes with costs. Uh, so mm -hmm. if your business can contain those costs, Duncan, we've lost you a bit there. If you could just go okay. to what you were saying. Uh, okay, I think my internet was unstable. So I was saying the motor, motorcycle is good, but no, it comes also with the costs. If it is going to impact negatively on your profits, maybe this is not the time for the motorcycle. But unfortunately, we don't know how small is your small business. So, so this is a case by case 
you can look at, but you invest in something that brings in more impact positively on your revenue. Maybe I can stop it at that point uh, of uh, answer. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we have a few minutes, a minute or two, we can take one question from Kinoti. Yes. Uh, comment on startups with zero capital with a sharp business plan and growing business model. Can you advise on any angel investors known to you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks, Kenoti. I don't have any investors who are known to me, especially those who want to invest in startup. I've told you that uh, investors are very shy on startups because you may call it uh, a sharp business plan, uh, but you know nothing about that business. So start up, start with your own resources. Okay. The best is to look for your own resources, start with them and learn and see how that business goes before you call in investors. Otherwise, you'll be running all over this town with it with the debts. And uh, it's not a good thing when you start accumulating debts you can't pay. Because every business is a learning, has a learning curve. Great. Mm -hmm. um, a few more questions coming in. Uh, we'll give uh, five more minutes to the Q&A. Yes. We will take questions from uh, Oliver is asking, does DTB or KBA help with financial modeling for MSMEs? Uh, I'm sure we can talk for okay. KBA right now, but uh, I believe they do. Okay. As, as for DTB, uh, currently we are developing something like that. If you join us for the next session, which is in uh, uh, on 10th uh, November, you'll be able to hear more on this. This is something we are currently working on as this is at the heart of our core business right now. Ah, wonderful. That's great. Yes. Great. Um, like I said, we cannot answer for KBA. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I don't want also to answer for KBA, but I believe when DTB uh, says that, it reflects the, uh, the you know, yes. it's existing in the business, what is it? It's in the banking industry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Enoch is asking, there are vi viable investments in frontier regions, but the risk is high because of security and climatical conditions. Can insurance be a bias, a basis to give confidence to investors? A good question, Enoch. Yes, insurance is always a good basis to give confidence. But as you have indicated, you must be able to demonstrate the viability of your investments in those regions you are saying they are high risk. So it will start with you to demonstrate how viable are your investments before you give your basis of insurance to, to increase your confidence. Yeah. Great. Okay, we'll take one last question from Gary Sean. What is the best model for building a working capital for financing projects? Uh, Gary Sean, that's a good question. What's the best model for building a working capital for financing projects? Uh, capital all the time, as much as possible, um, you must have your own capital to start with. So if maybe you are in employment, you accumulate some capital, if whatever business, whatever you are doing now, have your own capital first, then get knowledge in how uh, projects operate. If I get the question right, then from there, you understand, once you understand how they run, then you can only go for more capital once you demonstrate that uh, you can be able to pay back. Investments and uh, capital providers are about how you can pay back. So arm yourself with information, information is power before you proceed on to invest in an area you don't understand very well. Great, ladies and gentlemen, that's our time. I'd like to remind you that uh, next week we will take a break. Today was what was supposed to be our last session. However, our digital and innovations department requested for a session with you, which will be on 10th November. They would like to tackle uh, digital payments for SMEs. And during this session, they will be able to answer questions on shifting uh 
cashless payments that SMEs are facing right now, the types of digital payments that SMEs are likely to incur, and, and the benefits for cashless payments to SMEs. So we will send a reminder of that session. And uh, I can see someone asking about certificates. Yes, we will issue you with certificates of participation for the financial literacy sessions. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, I feel like it's bittersweet because I will miss you all next week. <laughs> but uh, we look forward to you guys joining us on 10th November. Duncan, if you have something to say, yeah, you will not see the people yeah, in a while. You. Thank you very much. Uh, I can see I still have 330 participants. Thank you all for listening. And uh, for any feedback, you'll get an email address on that presentation. Please let me have. I value feedback negative and positive. Feedback is feedback yeah. because that is what we use to improve our delivery also. So thank you very much and yeah. see you next time. Thank you guys once again and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you so much, Duncan. Thank you.